Hey from Sydney. All right. So welcome to our session on Crypto 101. Now, this is a session that you guys have been asking me to run for ages. So I thought, hey, let's do it. And so we are joined by one of the best in Australia um, to talk us about, talk to us about um, what is cryptocurrency. But before we get started and we introduce Tim just a little bit about LFC. So we'd love to hear, raise your hand, you might see the hand little button if you've been to an LFC event webinar or you've taken one of our courses before. Just, um, yeah, there should be a little place where you can raise a hand. If you can't, just stick it in the chat, a yay or a nay. So give us a Y, A, Y or a N, A, Y, a yay or a nay if you've joined us before. Fantastic. So we've got some newbies. So my name is Molly and I'm the founder of Ladies Finance Club um, in Australia and in the UK. So LFC is a club for women to come together where we can take control of our finances without the boring blue bits. Um, we have events, courses and workshops and we work with the best experts to break down different topics with a real emphasis on on investing so yeah so that's kind of where what we are and where we and what we started we realized that you know as women unfortunately um we are at a disadvantage there's a pay gap um we we generally um it's at 14 percent we're retiring on less we're investing less and we take um career breaks to have children look after family and what that means is yeah we're retiring on a lot less than our male counterparts. So, um, you know, what can we do? Well, we can learn to invest and we can make our money work hard for us. So that is what the club is all about. Awesome. Um, and we are running um, in Australia, running a three day seven trials. So we're gonna tell you more about that at the end. So if you wanna join the club, there's a whole bunch of benefits you get. I'm not gonna go into detail now, but if you do wanna stick around at the end, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And that's based in the moment in Australia and the UK. All right, we love competitions here at LFC, who doesn't? And if it wasn't on the gram, did it even happen? So tonight you've got a chance to win our online beginner's guide to investing. It's worth $197. It's so simple to enter. All you have to do is follow us on Instagram, um, take a snap of tonight's uh, webinar on crypto and um, tag us. Tim, are you guys on Instagram? <laughs> Uh, no, sadly not. <laughs> okay, Sorry. so don't worry about tagging Tim, but tag Ladies Finance Club um, Australia, uh, Ladies Finance Club or Ladies Finance Club UK, whatever one it is, and we'll announce the winner at the end. All right, what you're going to hear tonight is information, not advice. Please seek independent financial advice before making any big financial decisions. I'm sure Tim will cover that as well but why we are here. So we are here to learn about crypto, like WTF, what is crypto? Should we be investing? Is this a bandwagon we wanna be jumping on or we wanna be avoiding? Is this a fad or is digital currency gonna be the new currency of the future? Um, so Tim is extremely qualified and I'm just gonna read your bio here. Sorry, I hope this doesn't embarrass you, Tim. I know sometimes when we read out our speakers bios, they're like, oh God, no, but it's very impressive. So. You have combined traditional banking with technology investing. So previously, Tim's worked at an asset management um, a boutique Australian equities fund manager and was part of the investment team that looked after $33 billion in super fund money. Just the $33 billion? Yep, that seems like quite, quite a lot there. And then on the other side, Tim's worked as a venture capitalist association. Um, sorry, sorry, a capital venture capital associate at Dominant Venture Partners and has been active in cryptocurrency for a number of years and is also a CFA charter um, holder. So thank you so much, Tim, for coming on and sharing your knowledge with on what cryptocurrency is and all the jazz. Thank you, Molly. Um, uh, can people see my screen or? I'm just gonna stop sharing so you can share your screen. Excellent. Thanks, Molly. And thank you, everyone, for your interest in, in crypto. Um, yeah, crypto, it's a, it's a fascinating topic. Um, it's complicated. And I guess the first thing I'll say straight off the top is I don't expect anyone to have a complete understanding of crypto by the end of a one hour webinar. Um, I've been working in space for, for four years, as, as Molly said, and uh, I've, uh, 
I, I know more than I did four years ago, but it's a it's a pretty complex space. So the, the purpose of tonight is to sort of demystify it a little bit, uh, explain some basics. Uh, please send, send some questions in. If nothing else, it, it shows that people are listening and, and interested. Uh, hopefully Molly can relay them either during the chat or, uh, or at the end. Uh, but, uh, I'll just go back one step as well. Um, so uh, why am I qualified to talk about crypto? Um, as, as, as Molly mentioned, that was sort of my, my background. Uh, and more recently, uh, I'm a managing director of Apollo Capital, which is a crypto fund. Uh, so Apollo um, basically is a, a professionally managed uh, fund uh, that, that as opposed to you know, traditional assets like equities or bonds or property, the underlying asset is, is crypto assets. Uh, so that's one way to, to invest in crypto. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about other ways as well. So uh, why is crypto complex? I wanted to touch on that as well. Um, it, it's complex because if we stop and think about it, it, it actually combines a lot of different fields. Uh, it involves computer science. Basically, everything in crypto is, is code or, or software. Uh, it involves uh, cryptography, uh, mathematics. Uh, it involves you know, general technology. How does crypto affect or intersect with other technologies? Uh, and it also in, it involves finance um, and, and uh, you know, what, what particularly you know, what you guys discussed at, at Ladies Finance Club. So that sort of mishmash of all these different uh, fields can make it hard um, to sort of conceptualize. But I'll do my best tonight. And um, by all means, um, I, I guess my own experience is, is probably uh, not uh, unusual where I, uh, I think I went to a crypto meetup in, in 2015. Um, it was uh, very focused on Bitcoin and there's a very strong sort of uh, anarchist kind of libertarian theme to Bitcoin, um, which not everyone needs to associate with and I, and I don't necessarily associate strongly. Uh, and I went to this meetup and, and people were like, you know, the, the governments are corrupt and money's going to be worthless and all this sorts of stuff. And um, I kind of dismissed it. I came back to it in 2017, working for, for the chairman of Apollo Capital. Uh, and again, I was like, what's this Bitcoin business? And I was, I was very skeptical. Uh, working with, with Dom, uh, my chairman, I moved to then sort of indifference and eventually it was actually 10 minute, 10 months working with him. I thought, you know what, I've just got to buy some. <laughs> if I buy some, if I put some money in, uh, I'll, I'll learn about it. I'll probably pay more attention. I'll do that extra reading. Uh, that proved to be a very good financial decision uh, back in 2017 and, uh, and then you know, led to um, you know, something that I'm, I'm, I'm quite passionate about now. At, at Apollo, we're not um, evangelical with, with, with our attitude towards crypto. We try to be balanced. Uh, and if a good way to explain that is if you have a you know, hundred dollars to invest, uh, maybe two dollars or maybe five dollars uh, is worthwhile going into crypto. We we certainly don't advocate putting uh, you know fifty dollars or, or fifty percent of, of of someone's portfolio into crypto because it is it is risky, it's young, uh, and it's very volatile. So let's talk about uh, the blockchain. So what is the blockchain? Um, the blockchain is uh, block. We get a, a common question at Apollo. Um, not as much recently, but, it, but certainly in earlier days that oh, yeah, I'm big on blockchain, but I'm not big on crypto. And so well, what, are the, what are the two mean? Uh, crypto assets are the assets that are traded along a blockchain. Uh, and a blockchain is effectively a, a glorified database. Uh, so the, the difference between a, a blockchain as opposed to a central database is that a blockchain, uh, in, especially in the, in the context of crypto assets, is uh, independently uh, decentralized, uh, maintained by a network of participants. So it's not maintained by one person. If we think about a, a, a bank as an example, uh, the bank will have a central database of its customers and how much uh, each of the customers um, uh, have at that particular bank. Uh, crypto uh, and Bitcoin as an example, as a sort of a comparison to, to money, um, the blockchain behind uh, or the Bitcoin blockchain is uh, independently uh, decentralized, uh, uh, verified on a, on a global scale. And so that's, that's very different. It's, it's, it, what it means is that it's not, um, you, you can't censor people. It means that it, it's widely available. Anyone can join uh, around the world. It trades 24 seven and there's not some central gatekeeper that says, Molly, sorry, you can't trade today. We're gonna, we're gonna take that $50 uh, off you that, that you previously had. And that has happened a number of times throughout history. Um, most recent example I can think of is, um, I think there was some, uh, the Bank of Cyprus uh, confiscated some money in, in, in Cypriot bank accounts back in maybe 2011, 2013. Uh, and so that, that can happen. And, and so the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, again, global, decentralized, anyone can participate. Uh, and, and really it's just the code that governs that participation. So talking about how a blockchain works, uh, transactions requested, 
uh, transactions if we use the Bitcoin example. And I'll use the Bitcoin example a lot uh, because most people start with Bitcoin uh, and then there's a raft of other crypto assets which we may or may not have time for. Uh, but Bitcoin um, example, a block is created every 10 minutes. And so every transaction that happens within a 10 minute period, give or take, uh, then sort of forms a block. That block, block is sent to every node in the network. And as I said before, you've got thousands, millions, tens of thousands of people around the world, all independently uh, operating nodes. Uh, the nodes validate a transaction, which basically says, yep, this transaction is good to go. Uh, nodes receive a, a reward for proof of work. Uh, and that's also called mining. You might've heard the term Bitcoin mining. Um, it's, it's similar to uh, the concept of gold mining, really. You're spending a lot of energy to extract a resource. Uh, gold mining, you've obviously got the whole process with Bitcoin, uh, we're expending energy electricity. Uh, that block is then added to an existing blockchain. Uh, and if we think about, we've got the whole blockchain sort of going back this way, the new block is added on over here and it sort of grows and grows and grows and gets bigger and bigger. Uh, and then the transactions complete. Now that's a pretty simple overview. Um, but again, I said at the top, it all comes back to software. The software, the Bitcoin software sets out the rules, it sets out how to use um, the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain, Bitcoin software, uh, and it's up to people to, to you know, use that or not. Um, what some uh, people do over time is they think, okay, we can create a better Bitcoin and we'll change the software, we'll, we'll give it some different um, use cases, we'll, we'll change the, the terms of it, we'll change the block size, uh, and we'll create different crypto assets. Um, and we, as I said, we can talk about that a little bit later. So, that, <laughs> There's gonna be a lot to talk about tonight. So again, uh, most of this is high level and, and what I really wanna do is just sort of touch on some high level concepts to, to, to try and make uh, Bitcoin and, and crypto assets a little bit more relatable. I think a really good way to make Bitcoin relatable is to compare it to gold. Uh, so gold, we all know and love, uh, it's been around for thousands of years. Um, and if we stop and sort of think about the function of money and, and gold, we think about, well, why is gold valuable? Uh, and you know, what, what makes gold more valuable over grey lead or coal or <laughs> other, other commodities? Uh, and really um, what we think uh, makes gold valuable is it has certain properties. And those properties are, are here on the, uh, on the left side. Uh, gold's scarce, uh, it's portable, it's storable, it's fungible, which means it can be interchanged uh, equally. So one gram of gold equals one gram of gold uh, and it's, and it's non-sovereign. So if we think about thousands of years ago, when the concept of money was developed, um, we, you know, there's all sorts of you know, stories of, of, of uh, tribes and, and people using shells uh, and rare, you know, rare sort of beads and things like that as uh, a, a medium of exchange. Um, but gold became the sort of de facto global currency because of these properties. Um, it's, it's the right amount of scarce. It's not too scarce, but it, it's uh, not too uh, common. It's not like wood, for example. Uh, it's the right amount of portable. It, you can move it around easily. You can store it uh, and, and it's, um, it's non-sovereign. And so gold's market cap today is uh, estimated around about 10 to 11 US trillion dollars. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it might be about 2,500 Australian dollars uh, per ounce. So that's, that's sort of what makes gold valuable. Um, and yeah, a common uh, criticism that, that, or, or question that, that we receive about Bitcoin is, well, where can I spend it? And I would equally say, well, where can you spend your gold? And generally you, you can't. <laughs> There's not many places that will allow gold to, to buy your coffee uh, or your, you know, your car or your house. And so um, gold and, and I would argue Bitcoin are not trying to fulfill that um, role of, of money, which is, which is called a medium of exchange. Um, there's three different types of or roles of money. There's a, a unit of account, which is pricing things. There's a store of value and there's a medium of exchange. And that medium of exchange, I think, is really you know, dominated by US dollars, Australian dollars. Uh, and uh, Bitcoin and gold, I think, are more relevant to that store of value side of, of the role of money. We think Bitcoin is better than gold. Um, we think Bitcoin is more scarce. Um, it's easier to transfer. It's easier to store, easier to divide. And it's also programmable. So whereas more and more gold gets dug out of the ground, uh, Bitcoin has a finite cap. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin in circulation. And that is expected to happen in the year 2140. So 2140. 
So sorry, Tim, are there some Bitcoin which haven't even been mined yet or created? Yes, yes. So there's about 18 and a half million that are in existence now. And the other two and a, is that two, yep, two and a half million uh, will be mined over the next 120 years. And so Bitcoin has a, a release schedule. Uh, and this comes back to this point here in the, in the terms of the you know, validating blockchain and operating blockchains. Uh, and that um, release schedule will diminish over time and eventually uh, cap out in the year 2140. So uh, the other thing is, is that um, uh, there, there are, um, have been a number of instances where, where people have actually sort of lost their Bitcoin, uh, which is a, a downside of Bitcoin, but it's actually a better thing in the, that it means that it's even more scarce. Um, it's also easy to transfer, and that's probably the you know the clearest advantage over. Well, I'd say scarcity is as well, but the ability to transfer Bitcoin is far superior to gold. I can, uh, you know, a ladies' finance club, for example, if you want to transfer uh, money to or if, to to someone in the UK, um, try doing that doing doing it in gold. We we recently operated uh, opened a second uh, fund that's based in the um, British Virgin Islands. And just transferring dollars is hard enough. It's a nightmare. Um, the number of times I tried to transfer test transactions and it bounced back and Bitcoin is very easy. All you need is a, an address and you can send it and it will be there in about you know, 10 minutes, give or take. Uh, Bitcoin's also easy to store. Uh, it's cheaper. It can be, it can work the other way. Like I said, people can lose their Bitcoin, but with a bit of technical know-how, uh, it, it can um, be a little bit easier and it's more divisible. So Bitcoin's actually divisible up to a hundred million. And if you lose your Bitcoin, is it lost forever? It, it depends. So we'll, we'll talk about ways to invest in uh, crypto and, and Bitcoin. But if you invest in it through an exchange, like a centralized uh, party, then uh, you, you can, you know, if you lose your, it's just like a, any other login details. You can call support and say, hey, I need to change my password and you, and you start again. If you do it in the more purest way, which is, uh, so the way I store my Bitcoin is I hold the Bitcoin uh, with the help of some uh, third party devices, uh, but I have basically sole custody and, and, uh, of that Bitcoin. If I lose that, if I lose the devices uh, or lose the backups to the devices, uh, then it's gone forever. Great example, we, we did um, these uh, crypto and cocktails nights at, um, at Apollo Capital in, in oh, Melbourne. Oh, that sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, was, it was good fun. Um, should have a cocktail now, actually. Uh, and uh, I used, a, um, used it on my phone and I uh, actually upgraded my phone recently and I had the backup for, uh, I guess, my, my personal Bitcoin, but I didn't have the backup for the, the, the corporate Bitcoin that I was using in my, to, to share Bitcoin around uh, these crypto and cocktails events. Uh, and that, that is now lost. That Bitcoin's gone forever. It was only about 40 bucks at the time. It's a couple of hundred bucks now. So I was hoping I could get it back. Uh, but it is, it is gone forever. Okay. And who controls Bitcoin? Like, is there a dude who sits at a desk, highly guarded? Or who, <laughs> I mean, like, who, who, yeah, who controls it? Who controls it? So that comes back to what I mentioned at the start, Molly, that no one's in control. And that's quite, that's quite revolutionary. That's quite mm -hmm. special. If we think about everything else, our bank accounts, the bank accounts are in control. Even higher up than the bank accounts, we've got the RBA in, in, in Australia, they're in control of the monetary supply. Housing, you know, the government can compulsory acquire your housing, the land. Uh, generally, there are people in control of things, but uh, with Bitcoin, nobody is in control. So then the question is, well, how does it uh, work? And that comes back to the code. Uh, and what happens is that in the Bitcoin software, uh, the rules are set out, if you like, uh, and people um, you know, play by those rules. Now the question then is, well, how do those rules come into existence? And that's where it gets interesting. Um, so the, the story of digital money, uh, crypto assets, actually started in 1978. There was a, a, a guy in the States that started researching the concept of digital cash, uh, David Charles, his name. Uh, and 30 years later, uh, we came out with, a, well, we came out, the world uh, came out with a, a guy called Satoshi Nakamoto, who is a pseudonymous. Um, so, he, or basically anonymous, uh, and he um, came up with the, the rules for the Bitcoin software. So he coded it up. He said, this could work. Here you go, world, through a, through a forum. Uh, but he remained anonymous. Now, the part of the brilliance of Bitcoin is him remaining anonymous. Because if he didn't remain anonymous, you can imagine the scrutiny that would be placed on him. You can imagine every, the, the influences, the influence that he would have. Uh, but by remaining anonymous, it's basically you know, for, for the, the people who use Bitcoin to work out how to govern it and how to use it. Okay. 
and sorry, I'm just, I know we're, we're still moving, but I'm just going to hit you on one more question. Sure, sure. If this guy's coded it and created it, does that mean someone can hack into the code and recreate it or change it? Uh, no. So the, the way that that works is uh, if we went back to day, day one, he released the software and he said, if you like what we're doing, you can use the software. Now to make changes, uh, say 10 people came on board to make changes, you basically need a critical mass of people to agree to then go and use some other form of software to change it. So the software can be changed but it's, it's a little bit government governed by consensus, which, which is actually probably a, a negative of Bitcoin or, or a trade-off because to make changes, to upgrade things, uh, you know, gov government by consensus is, you know, never, never really works because you've got to get you know, a number of different people to, to agree. Uh, but that's where, again, I touched on before, you can create different assets. So if, if you and Ladies Finance Club, we all decided we don't like Bitcoin, we're going to go and create our own coin. We can sort of use the framework that he set out um, or that was set out in, in initial Bitcoin uh, and that has changed you know, 10 years, 12 years later, and we can go and create our own coin. Uh, and, and that it's then up to us to sort of create a coin that might be deemed valuable and useful by the broader crypto network and, and other, you know, other people using technology. Wow, there's so much in this, isn't there? <laughs> That's okay. All right, I'll let you keep moving on. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so uh, a very simple comparison here is uh, the market cap of or, or the value of all the uh, gold in the world today, uh, comparing that to the um, value of Bitcoin. So I mentioned before, the estimated um, value of all the gold in the world is around 11 trillion US dollars. Excuse me, Bitcoin, it's a lot less. Um, it's about 1.3 uh, trillion at the moment, I think. So uh, from an investment point of view, um, that's where we think it makes sense to have a small allocation to, to crypto assets and to Bitcoin. Uh, if Bitcoin is at 1.3 and gold is at 11, and we assume that Bitcoin's better than gold, which is a big assumption, uh, there's, a, you know, there's a 10x opportunity there. Uh, and, and so that's where then it comes back to, well, you know, it might not happen, um, but it might make sense to have a, a, a little bit of exposure to, to Bitcoin. Um, that's what I sort of did back in the day. Um, I, you know, I just invested a little bit um, and you know, that proved to be a good decision. Going forward, uh, obviously there's no guarantee in, 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 in finance and investing, um, but you can see that there's sort of a valuation case there that if Bitcoin were to be on a par with gold, um, you know, there's quite a lot of upside um, or if Bitcoin were to be even better than gold, um, there's, there's even more upside still. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to um, keep this uh, high level again because because we, we can sort of deep uh, uh, dive deep into the weeds, but what is mining? So, so mining is the process of validating transactions. Uh, anyone, just as anyone can own Bitcoin and send Bitcoin and receive Bitcoin, anyone be can become a Bitcoin miner. Bitcoin mining happened back in the start by the use of our personal computers. Uh, it was very simple. Uh, there weren't many other miners around. Uh, and the process is, is really uh, highly summarized as running software to just crunch numbers uh, and then it's potluck. Uh, and so what has happened as, become, as Bitcoin has become more valuable, uh, the more miners have moved into the market uh, and there's been a lot more computing power. Now that computing power leads to more competition uh, and then that leads to uh, more computing power, all vying for a small prize. The actual, the actual process, uh, as I touched on, is, is, is really just crunching numbers. It's actually um, trial and error. The, the maths behind it is, is a trial and error uh, mathematical problem uh, with the um, solution to the problem designed to be solved every 10 minutes or so. So you remember back before when I was talking about the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, a block is added every 10 minutes. And then when that solution is released, uh, the community comes together and goes, yep, that's actually the solution. We can do the maths to that. Uh, we agree that that's the solution. And then that block is sealed onto the existing blockchain. And then a new uh, blockchain comes, comes along. Uh, high level, just think about it as expending energy to uh, mine some Bitcoin. You may or may not get it. These days, uh, the way miners operate globally, uh, it's basically a race for the cheapest electricity. Uh, we can't do it here in Australia, so far as I know. Uh, I think I'm paying my 14 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, the miners are, uh, are looking for you know, either uh, very cheap electricity 
uh, or sometimes even free electricity where um, there's some, some good stories of uh, re uh, surplus renewable energy around the world in Canada and in China, where there's surplus renewable energy at different times, so, so off peak, uh, and they use that electricity to, to mine Bitcoin. Um, so that's mining. Um, Bitcoin versus blockchain, we sort of, we talked, uh, talked about that one. Um, why does it cost so much to send a transaction? That's a good question. So the answer to that is if we think about, uh, actually, let me go back a step. To send a Bitcoin transa uh, transaction, if I'm going to send it to Molly, uh, I can actually set the fee that I want to pay for that transaction. So I can say I'm going to send ten dollars, and I'm going to uh, send one dollars off to the miner, one dollar off to the miners. Uh, now the miners basically can pick and choose whether they want to validate that transaction. If if the high level overview is if it's really competitive and the Bitcoin uh, blockchain is is really busy and there's lots of activity, there's lots of transactions you need to increase the cost of that transaction for it to get picked up. If it's not busy, if it's uh, November 2018 and no one's talking about Bitcoin, uh, you can set your transaction fee at three cents and it will probably get picked up. At the moment, um, Bitcoin hasn't been too bad. The, the, the real offender actually at the moment is Ethereum, which is the second biggest crypto asset. Uh, and the, uh, it has been quite expensive to, to send money on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, that's probably also one of the reasons where coming back to the start, I don't think personally, I don't think Bitcoin will be this medium of exchange where we can use it to pay for our coffees and pay for our cars and uh, lunches, et cetera. And, and that's part, partly, partly because of this, because it can, the network can get clogged uh, and it can become expensive to, to send Bitcoin. So when you say we have to pay the miners, is that kind of like when you, and this might not be what it's like, but is that kind of like when we buy an ETF, we pay a fee, we pay like, let's say $14 to the bank because um, we've used their exchange. Is that different bit. to, is that a little bit like it or is that something yeah. different? Yeah, I guess, I guess it is a little bit similar in that it's a, it's a transaction fee and you've got, uh, groups that are performing a function and, and, and taking that feed to perform that function. And so miners are not, they don't have a pick and a shovel. Like obviously <laughs> they got their name from the whole gold mine concept, but yeah. miners um, could be, could I be a miner? You could, yes, anyone could be a miner. So all you need is to run the Bitcoin software uh, and some computing power. So Molly, if you take your, I've got my Mac in front of me. If I take my Mac and I do that, I go and connect it up to electricity. Uh, basically my chances of solving that problem are proportional to the amount of effort that I throw at it. So if, we've, if it's pure economics, if everyone is competing, if I double my uh, computing power that I throw at the uh, at Bitcoin mining, then my chances double. Uh, and so then it comes down to what's the cost of the electricity versus the likelihood of actually solving the mining problem and being rewarded in new Bitcoin. At the moment, the reward every 10 minutes in new Bitcoin, Bitcoin is 6,125 Bitcoin. Now, as a price, uh, what's, well, here's my maths, it's uh, about 70,000 Aussie a coin at the moment, times 6,000, um, so what's that, 42 million, 4 million, 4.2 million, that's the reward every 10, uh, 10 minutes. Um, the problem is, is that because that's such a big reward, there's obviously a lot of a lot of competition uh, and uh, a lot of computing power thrown at it, so that they, um, yeah, that the people behind that computing power increases their chances of winning it. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> I have like twenty other questions off the back of it, but I'll let you keep yeah. going. Okay. Um, mining, mining is a common one that stops uh, people. There's lots of YouTube videos. Go and check it out there. Um, so three pillars to understanding Bitcoin. Coming back to conceptualizing Bitcoin, why, why is it important uh, and how can we understand it? First, economics. Uh, we sort of touched about this in the comparison to gold. A limited supply uh, and an exponentially diminishing supply curve over time. So in today's environment, uh, Molly, you've probably been talking about the Fed, uh, the RBA, every central bank around the world is just printing money galore. Traditionally, yeah. what's happened in history is that always led, leads to inflation. You print more money, it doesn't it, all it does is it devalues the existing money that's already out there. In today's society, there's a very strong argument that to have something that is scarce uh, and can be considered valuable, a little bit like gold, a little bit like Bitcoin, uh, if that scarcity stays similar and other assets such as uh, dollars, which is the other side of the Bitcoin equation, uh, become less valuable, then the Bitcoin becomes more valuable. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of... Um, 
uh, speaks to that sort of macroeconomic context and, and how Bitcoin um, fits in there. Technology. Uh, so blockchain and cryptography uh, are the center of why Bitcoin and crypto assets have the potential to disrupt financial markets. Uh, I touched on before that people have been looking into and studying the concept of digital cash since 1978. It's taken 30 years. Uh, there have been four or five genuine attempts uh, and most of those attempts failed because of a central party, um, which is that sort of question you, you, you touched on before, uh, Molly, about who, who's, who's you know, behind it. Uh, but Bitcoin is, is decentralized and it's a fundamental breakthrough in computer science. Uh, it really is a, an innovative technology uh, that, is, uh, you know, that is groundbreaking. Um, the ideology. Uh, majority of current investors in Bitcoin did not hold uh, the same libertarian views as the original supporters. Um, I'd, I'd be one of them. Um, but cutting out the established middlemen and financial freedom is at the core of what make, makes Bitcoin so valuable. And so there, something to think about there is uh, we can have a personal bank account uh, in our phones using Bitcoin. We don't need to answer to ING or HSBC or Westpac or whoever the, the, the bank is. Uh, I could you know, receive Bitcoin and I can use it by basically you know, using it on my mobile phone. And that's pretty cool. And, and it's probably um, less, uh, I guess, uh, obvious in uh, sophisticated jurisdictions like Australia and, and UK where we have sophisticated banking systems and, and more or less anyone can go and open a bank account. Um, but where it's really cool is in Afghanistan, where uh, women actually, there's a really cool story of this, this woman who, um, women can't open bank accounts in, in Afghanistan, I understand it's very difficult. And this story that I heard um, uh, was this entrepreneur, Afghan entrepreneur, uh, she started paying her employees in uh, Bitcoin, uh, because what would happen otherwise, if they got paid in the local currency, uh, they'd take it home to their husbands and their husbands would basically just take the cash. Uh, mm -hmm. And one woman actually saved up enough in Bitcoin to then pay a lawyer to get a divorce from her abusive husband. Um, so there's lots of really cool stories like that uh, and interesting stories in, in less developed um, nations around the world where um, that ability to actually own your asset yourself is quite powerful. Definitely. We do work with um, Vanuatu and we know it's completely cash society. So you can see where something like this would be so such a big, um, would have such a big impact, um, especially for the women. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Why the big deal? Um, so... <laughs> Aside from what we've talked on, which which I think is a big deal, um, and this sort of this slide starts to talk about other crypto assets out there. Uh, there's this concept of of DeFi, decentralized finance, uh, where the uh, basically anyone can can come along and uh, create similar financial infrastructure using crypto assets to what exists in the traditional financial infrastructure. Um, so that's a bit to get your head around. Um, but if we think about centralized finance. Uh, being re revolving around banks, being revolving around your broker, like you said, Molly, uh, there's ways now to trade assets, uh, to borrow and to lend other crypto assets all through the use of software. Uh, and so we describe that as open and permissionless innovation on a global scale, uh, which is really, um, really quite a big deal. Some people out there, uh, some of my colleagues even will say that yeah, th this is replacing traditional finance. I'm a little bit more balanced. I don't think it's going to replace traditional finance. Uh, but I do think it can operate in parallel, just like you know, I, I don't think uh, people are going to start using Bitcoin as their as their personal bank account. I think there's still a lot of advantages just to using a bank, but it can operate in parallel and it can create a lot of value uh, over the process. So part of uh, us at Apollo and sort of managing a professional fund is there's these use cases that we've seen so far with crypto assets and blockchain, uh, but we're going to see a whole lot more. Uh, and it makes sense to have sort of professionals looking at the new uh, use cases uh, as they develop and appear. Mm -hmm. So update on crypto markets. Uh, so this is where it gets, um, well, I shouldn't say this is where it gets really interesting. Hopefully it's been interesting up until now. Uh, um, but <laughs> It has, very interesting. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. Um, but if we think about uh, investments and how they sort of uh, proliferate down to uh, us, the, the common people, the common folk, uh, it, it really usually starts at the institutional level and then works down. And uh, if we think about probably the last asset class I can think of would be infrastructure. Uh, so things like ports and railways and um, you know, airports. Um, that was you know, started at the institutional scale. And now as a you know, mum and dad investor, we, we can invest through you know, different, uh, different avenues. Bitcoin and crypto assets is actually the complete opposite. It started with the, the retail, it started with the people 
and now it's the institutions that are getting into it. And there's a real opportunity for people that move early before those institutions to you know, capture a lot of that value. Um, so these two guys, Ray Dalio, Stanley Druckenmiller. Um, Ray Dalio is probably one of the most famous hedge fund managers in the world. Um, he, he founded and, and runs a firm called Bridgewater. Um, I'm not sure how much they manage. It would be a very, very large amount. Uh, and very highly regarded, very successful investor, or both of them are. And, and this is two examples of, of people coming out and saying, you know what, we actually think Bitcoin's pretty cool uh, and, and it has a place and, and um, we may or may not be allocating it uh, to, to the space. Mm -hmm. 2020 was, was really, there's probably been two breakout years in crypto. Uh, crypto, the, the first time you may have heard of it may have been 2017 where Bitcoin uh, you know, um, just basically, uh, really sort of became well known. Uh, and then last year is, is the other example. Uh, and so there's a number of examples here. Paul Tudor Jones is another very famous um, finance guy, invested in Bitcoin in May 2020, timed it beautifully. Um, MicroStrategy is, is a, a business on the New York, uh, New, or NASDAQ, I think it is. Uh, and they've actually bought Bitcoin in their corporate treasury. So the money just sitting around in their um, you know, corporate bank accounts. Um, Square is run by Jack Dorsey, who also founded Twitter. Um, big Bitcoin advocate, PayPal, I mean, PayPal is enormous. That's, that'd be interesting where that whole using crypto to pay for things, I think is quite interesting. They, they do allow that. Um, the problem I have there in terms of the idea of still using crypto assets to pay for things is you still need that intermediary. So you still need that PayPal, or that Visa or that MasterCard to actually process transactions uh, to merchants. And so if you still got an intermediary, it somewhat sort of defeat the purposes, defeats the purpose. But the fact that PayPal are on board and allowing people to buy and sell crypto, that's a very big deal because I've got a lot of customers. Um, JP Morgan, massive bank, really interesting case. In 2017, the CEO, uh, Jamie Dimon, came out and said, hate Bitcoin, don't want anything to do with it. A couple of years later, there's an opportunity here. <laughs> They're all over it. Uh, and they've put out some research uh, that they think you know, Bitcoin could reach $650,000 per coin. Going back a step just on that, I talked about uh, Bitcoin and if it were to be the same value as gold. Uh, if that were to happen, the Bitcoin price would be around about $500,000 US per coin. Um, so just to put that in context, that's wow. actually more than the um, current gold supply. Uh, Mass Mutual, another very influential uh, and very, very large uh, investment company. Uh, and then the big one that, that many may know of is, is Tesla and Elon Musk coming out and buying one5 billion in um, yeah, worth of Bitcoin on their on their corporate balance sheet. Uh, so that so there's a lot of both uh, very savvy institutional investors uh, and technologists like Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk that are coming out and throwing their support uh, behind Bitcoin. Great. Now we know this is like real crypto 101. So we're scratching the surface of all the areas, but there's just so much in this. So I guess looking at kind of like the next part was is around the currencies. And so um, we're hearing a lot about the different currencies. So I guess like on the next slide, what are the main currencies um, and how do we buy them? Should we be buying them? Is there, should we kind of go down that traditional route of like buying, investing for the long term? Um, yeah, can I guess, can you maybe just start with breaking down what are all the different coins? Yes, yes. Um, I, well, I should start by saying that uh, last I checked, there's about 7,000 different coins. Uh, we invest in about 20 to 25. Uh, and we think that probably about 6,900 of them are, uh, of the other coins are probably worthless. There's a lot of speculation in this space. Um, uh, there's, there's, you know, we might be wrong, of course. We're not always right, uh, as, as is the case in investing. Uh, but there's a lot of different coins out there. So I can touch on some of the, the main ones. Um, and by all means, I, I think Bitcoin's a really good place to start, as I've touched on. Uh, with tonight's presentation uh, and then if people do want to go and do some research on other coins um, by all means um, probably the other biggest one is is ethereum um, so that's the second largest crypto asset that's this one here can you see my cursor yeah yeah yep. uh, so ethereum is what we call a uh, smart contracting platform uh, and it allows uh, people to execute code automatically so if i could dumb that down i'll use an example uh, an example that I heard of is flight insurance. So the concept that you can buy some insurance against your flight being delayed or cancelled. Uh, I've never bought it, but apparently it exists. Uh, there was a case a couple of years ago of an insurance company coming out and building an insurance product built on Ethereum. Now, what would happen there was that if a flight was delayed or cancelled, 
and that information is digital it's public you you get the feed from the airport or wherever it is or the airline uh, that would then feed into a contract which is the insurance contract built on top of ethereum which would then execute automatically now and so if the flight was cancelled straight away you get paid your insurance uh, your, uh, insurance money now if we think about the two examples there that code uh, could run on a centralized computer like my laptop but then in true crypto decentralized, no one's in charge kind of way, uh, well, I could change the code, right? Like it's on my computer or I could go, you know what, actually I'm not gonna let that code execute because I'm not really happy about that uh, you know, in, in insurance contract uh, and, and uh, you know, insurance companies, they, they're gonna dispute them. <laughs> um, Ethereum allows that code to be executed automatically. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite complex, uh, but it's quite innovative. innovative where uh, a lot of other developers in the crypto space can develop applications on top of Ethereum and then execute automatically. Also, I'll leave it there. Um, Litecoin. Uh, Litecoin uh, is, has been described as the silver uh, to, to Bitcoin's gold. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically a lighter version of Bitcoin where it, there are, uh, it can handle a greater throughput of transactions. So it's trying to own that medium of exchange space where uh, Litecoin, you can spend it, the transaction cost might be a lot less, like we talked about at the other slide, uh, and you can send Litecoin um, around the world uh, or, or you know, different places more quickly. Um, we're not big on Litecoin because we don't, for the reasons I mentioned about medium exchange, uh, but um, yeah, that, that's another major asset. I'll give one more example. Um, so Monero down here, uh, Monero is um, uh, similar to Bitcoin, but it's actually got a really strong privacy side to it. So Bitcoin, you might have heard about how it's um, you know, completely private. It's actually not. It's a public ledger. Anyone can log into blockchain.info and pull up transactions and you can see the transactions going through. You can actually see them fitting through, which is kind of cool. And you can see some really big ones, like multi-million dollar ones and um, you know, some, some big transactions. Monero is, is similar to Bitcoin, decentralized, uh, but very, very strong privacy so that you can't, uh, you know, you basically can't trace uh, different transactions. And so that, that has sort of value for, for certain purposes. I'll touch on, touch on it there because um, otherwise I'll sort of go a little bit deep into the weeds. Um, yeah. But there are lots of, lots of ones out there. Um, which ones you should invest in, um, that's, you know, that's sort of uh, up, up to you. Um, there was another question you touched on, Molly, on this slide. Um, oh, the long-term aspect. So... I, I'm, I'm a big believer that uh, anyone investing in crypto should do it for a, a long term with a long term time frame. Um, we say at Apollo, uh, an investments in our fund, a minimum uh, time frame of three years. That's just a, a recommendation. That's not a hard and far, uh, hard fast uh, rule. Uh, but uh, I, I think if you if you come back to why you sort of investing in the space, it's disruptive technology. It's going to take a long time to play out. Uh, you know, five, ten years, uh, I, I think, is a great. Um, is, is a great way to look at it. Sure, people will trade it shorter if they want, um, but I, I think the, the longer term time frame makes sense. And we always say three things when you do any investment of any type, make sure you get rid of all your high interest debt first before you start investing, yet have that time frame of at least three to five years that you're not gonna need that money and have your emergency fund um, set up, which is your three to six months worth of um, expenses. So three months worth of cash sitting in an account. So if something does happen, um, you don't have to try and get that money out. You've got um, your own money separate, which you can use. Cool. So how do we invest into cryptocurrency? <laughs> okay, we sort of touched on this before. So I'll, I'll go through, um, I think it's the next slide. Okay, so how can we buy crypto? So um, if you're what's called a wholesale investor in Australia, uh, the best way definitely without a shadow of doubt is to invest into the Apollo Capital Fund. Um, if, if you're not, or you don't want to invest in the fund, that's totally fine. Uh, <laughs> probably the, the, the logical starting point is an exchange. Uh, there's a couple of examples here. Coinbase is a great example. Uh, that's uh, rumored to IPO shortly with a hundred billion dollar valuation. One of the most successful businesses within crypto. Uh, others are, are very similar to like a brokerage account. You go go there. You can you know, put some, send some dollars in, and then you can buy your, your crypto assets. Um, which ones to buy? Um, it's yeah, probably probably hard to to uh, sort of draw a conclusion from tonight's presentation. Um, I think yeah, as I've obviously made clear, Bitcoin's a great starting point, at least to sort of understand, uh, and then you can go you can go down from there. 
And it's worth saying to people as well, like you don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. You can buy 0.003% or $500 worth or 500 pounds worth of Bitcoin. We're not, ex- you're not expected to buy the whole coin unless you've got that kind of money and then <laughs> go nuts. But um, yeah, and a couple of these different platforms, um, I think it's uh, CoinSpot. It's an Australian one, whereas eToro is Coinbase. They're kind of global. Yep, Coinjar um, is Australian as well, uh, but I think they've got UK operations as well. Yeah, great. Uh, Apollo Capital Fund, so I'll just touch on this quickly. If anyone's interested, uh, ApolloCap.io is our website or, or Google it, um, but uh, there's just some terms there. We have a minimum investment of 50K uh, Aussie. Um, we charge fees for it, currencies Australian. Um, there's that recommended investment term that I rec- uh, suggested of, of three years. Again, that's just a recommendation. Um, performance. So obviously the important thing with performance is that it's, it's not guaranteed to continue, but I guess this does show the upside potential of, of crypto assets, um, you know, 260% in one year, two year number of, of uh, these are actually wow. um, a little bit older. Um, so they're actually even better than that. Uh, but, you know, that since inception number, which I think is now about 150%, the investors that came in from the start, they've had a rocky, rocky road. Crypto is highly volatile. At one point, our fund was down 68%. Uh, so your hundred dollars went down to thirty-two, uh, and now we've come back to to now be worth one hundred and sixty-seven dollars uh, as at end of December. So that that volatility is is really important to understand that if you invest thousand bucks into to crypto and it goes down to five hundred and you start pulling your hair out, um, you've got in for the wrong reasons. You need to be prepared for that volatility. Like riding a roller coaster. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think we've got, yeah, 12 minutes. Okay. Are there any other questions? Awesome. Yeah, we've had a few questions come through. Um, so I guess a question um, for you, Tim, is should we buy it? Should we buy cryptocurrency? And I mean, you've mentioned um, if you, potentially starting with Bitcoin, but is there any other ones that you would say could potentially be a good, um, obviously not giving advice, but um, yeah, <clears throat> what would your answer be to should we buy it? Um, well, my first answer is I'm completely the wrong person to ask because I'm obviously highly biased uh, that, I, that I, you know, I obviously work in the space and you know, sort of devoted my career to it. So, uh, yes, I think you should. Uh, it comes back to how much. It, it's just like I said before, if you want to, if you feel comfortable putting in $100, that's fine. If you feel comfortable putting in yeah, $1,000, that's fine. Just be prepared for that volatility um, and, and don't get spooked if, if you know, that $100 becomes $20. Uh, which ones? Um, that that really is up to the individual. Uh, you know, I'd say you know, start with Bitcoin. Ethereum's a, a great a great asset. Um, there are other ones out there. There's sort of more spe- um, more speculative ones out there. But I kind of see crypto assets as a, like the the speculative side of the assets that are already there. They're much more risky than equities or bonds or property. So for me to say, oh, you should buy the 25th ranked coin because that's got even more potential. Um, you're already playing in a high return, high risk area. I don't think you need to sort of make it even higher risk, higher return. <laughs> okay, great. And then people are just asking with the exchange. So I'm assuming it is like when you buy shares online. So you sign up to a exchange, um, you deposit money. So you fund money into it. And someone said, can you use PayPal? Well, I guess it would depend on what that exchange takes. They would probably take, they might take a, a, a few ranges of payments um, that you deposit money into your crypto exchange and then you buy the currency and then it is in your crypto um, exchange account. Yep. So just like a brokerage account, like if you're buying yeah. equity, um, so very similar process, they'll have the same, you know, know your customer, anti-money laundering checks. They want to know that you are the person you say you are, uh, and then you transfer in your dollars or your pounds uh, and you can buy your you know, your stocks or your, your, your crypto assets and, and leave them there. Okay. And why are there so many currencies? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> look, we have I- a ladies finance club currency. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could, you could. Uh, look, I think there's probably two answers to that. One, I think it touched on um, the, sorry, what I touched on before about, we've got a fundamental breakthrough in computer science. uh, And so there's a lot of different applications that we are aware of and that we're not yet aware of. And so people are industrious folk, they're gonna come up with different crypto assets that could be potentially valuable. Uh, So that's the first answer. The second answer is uh, opportunity to raise money. And um, yeah, there has been hype throughout the process. 
So, you know, 2017, everyone had an ICO. There, there might have been a ladies' finance club coin and you just raise, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of Ethereum or whatever um, pretty quickly. And then you can you know, go and spend that. And it, it sort of, it, it sort of um, that evaporated, which is, which is a good thing um, because there's sort of, a bit, it's a bit murky as to you know, how uh, clean some of these operators were uh, and, and, you know, the use of the funds. Uh, but I guess a lot of people are creating coins with that hope of trying to you know, potentially be the next Bitcoin and you know, uh, distributing, say, 95% of the coins uh, with the one day, hopefully, you know, that the 5% they retain uh, are super valuable. Okay, great. And um, we had a question on, we had a few questions actually on just the environmental impact of mining Bitcoin. Yes. Because what, what a... I'm not sure what they're trying to say, but I think you know what they're trying to say. Yeah, what, yeah. Is, <laughs> what they're trying to say is, is, um, is, is, is it an environmental disaster? So this consumption of energy to mine Bitcoin, um, a lot of it's coal powered. And so oh. you know, burning more coal to, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm a pretty big grainy at heart myself. Um, and so it, it is an area of concern. I think, so I think there's two things. One, it is happening uh, and it's, it's not great. Um, the other thing is uh, there's a lot of green energy being used and the green energy, like I mentioned, if you've got renewables, you've got hydro, for example, hydro, as I understand, it doesn't really turn off, but if you've got hydro off peak at midnight when no one's using it, that energy is actually going to go somewhere. And so if you can use, I think I've even heard of some people being paid to consume the energy. Um, and so if the Bitcoin miners can, can do that, well then, you know, that's great. Um, the other thing is, is that there's a really interesting sort of media tale to this where this, Guy called, came out, I think his name is Digiconomist. He came out with his report saying that Bitcoin's using more energy than Britain, Sweden, and France all combined. And um, I've read a couple of reports which basically pull it apart and say it's, it's complete nonsense. Uh, but then if you look at every other news article that references Bitcoin as this ecological disaster, they all cite this one guy, this Digiconomist. Okay. So it's been quite interesting in terms of how you know, people come up with reports and uh, you know, the news flows accordingly. Okay, sorry, two more questions now. Yeah, um, one of the questions is um, from Anna. She said, okay, the price of Bitcoin is around 60000 US dollar. How can I invest if I don't have that much money? So yes. I think just, yeah, going over what we were saying before. Yep. yep, so Bitcoin, each Bitcoin is divisible into 100 million pieces. Uh, so that's 10 decimal points. Uh, so I do not own one Bitcoin. Um, I wish I did, but I do not. Uh, and so you can own a fraction of a Bitcoin. So the easiest way to think about it is there's no reason why you can't uh, buy $10 worth of Bitcoin or $100 worth of Bitcoin. As I think, well, you touched on earlier um, that if you buy $100 worth of Bitcoin, you will receive 0 0.00035 BTC Bitcoin. Yeah, and I know I have $365 worth of Bitcoin, which I imagine would be a very, very small percent of what a Bitcoin is. So again, um, you can, you don't have to buy the whole Bitcoin. So hopefully that answered your question, Anna. And then we had another question on tax. So would you have to pay capital gains tax on any profits you make with cryptocurrency? Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. The answer is yes. So, uh, and that actually sort of forms part of a, a bigger question, which is, uh, you know, is crypto regulated? And I get a lot of people saying, oh, you know, I can't invest in crypto because it's not regulated. It actually is. <laughs> it's actually quite regulated. And if you think about the governmental response, there's two areas of, two key areas of regulation. One is anti-money laundering. They don't want people, they don't want you know, drug traffickers and whatever to, to wash their money through Bitcoin uh, and then into to dollars or, or even into Bitcoin. And so everywhere around the world, like I touched on before, if you buy Bitcoin through an exchange, you're going to have to supply your ID, you're going to have to supply you know, proof of address or whatever they require to show that you are you. Uh, and then the money will come from your bank account, which is, you know, is presumed clean. The other area of regulation is tax. So the ATO, um, I'm not sure about the uh, Her Majesty's Royal, what's the UK equivalent? Um, the UK ATO, whatever they're called, uh, they, uh, they want HMRC. their- HMRC. HMRC, that's the yeah. one. Um, so they want their slice of the pie. So if you buy $1,000 worth of Bitcoin, it goes up to 10,000. You sell it, you take your 9,000 profit, uh, you've got to pay tax on that. My understanding, obviously speak to your accountant, my understanding is the usual tax rules apply which are if you've held the Bitcoin for more than 12 months, you get a 50% discount on the, on the capital gain. 
Great. And someone, sorry, very last question. Someone said, um, is it a good idea to drip feed in purchasing over time? Again, we talk about this lots in um, normal investing where we talk about dollar cost averaging. So this is where you're investing. So let's say you've got um, $10,000, just pick a number, 10,000 pounds. You're investing 1,000 every month. Um, so you are spreading your risk across the market. You're spreading your investment over time. So if the market goes up, you're hitting that. If the market goes down, you're hitting that. So the idea is that the dollar cost will average over the time. I think it's called pound cost averaging in the UK. Maybe we can call it crypto um, crypto cost averaging. Is that something you would agree with, Tim? Well, it's actually a very timely question because um, we, we have a blog on our website and we try to be very transparent in our thinking. And not this week, uh, we released every Tuesday, but not this week. Last Tuesday, I wrote an article on that very topic. I said, uh, I think dollar cost averaging is a great way to get into the space. Um, I have seen a lot of people, um, a mate of mine, I've tried to bash him over the head and I said, mate, just put some money in at $12,000 of Bitcoin at 20,000 and he hasn't. Uh, and now he's calling me too often saying, you know, when should I get in? Uh, he, his response is, I'll just wait for it to drop back to $30,000 as a coin. Uh, I've seen that response a lot and I've seen it not drop back to $30,000 a coin um, or you know, whenever someone was waiting for it. So um, dollar cost averaging, slicing it up into 10 pieces or four pieces, I think makes sense. Um, and, and really the, the reason there is the, is the volatility. Um, crypto is, is even more volatile, so maybe even makes more sense to dollar cost average uh, than say some of the other assets you're looking at. The important thing there, the difficulty with dollar cost averaging is the discipline. So actually saying, all right, I'm going to carve it up into 10, 10 spots and actually doing it at the first of every month. Because um, there's also there, there will always be reasons not to invest in crypto. It's risky. It's new. It's you know, people don't fully understand it. Uh, and so you know, if something happens, there'll be a reason not to do it. So that discipline of actually sticking to it is um, is the hard part. Oh, righty. Well, Tim, you have done such a fantastic job of trying to explain what I feel is quite a um, intense uh, topic um, very quickly within an hour. And I know we've just scratched the surface, but I'm definitely feeling like I know way more than I did an hour ago. Um, we would love to hear from everyone. Please put in the chat, what is your biggest takeaway tonight? Um, yeah, thanks. Yep, so says that's absolutely, it was absolutely brilliant. Love it. Um, there will be a recording of this available um, if you do want to see it. Um, a few people are going to still feel very lost. Well, you know, whether it was any type of investing, you know, this is something you are learning about for the very first time. So um, I imagine you will feel a little bit confused, but it is a starting point for you to then grow your knowledge and keep learning about it. Um, yep, great. People are feeling confident. They know what exchanges they can join on. So thank you so much, Tim, for, um, for sharing all that information with us. And uh, yeah, and as people said, it's opened their eyes um, to another way of investing. Um, yes, and we will send you out the recording. Um, we have your details, so that's all good. Um, fantastic. Now, I was just going to quickly jump on and share if anyone wants to learn a little bit more about Ladies Finance Club and what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve. Um, so I'm just going to quickly jump up a quick, super quick. I'm sorry, Tim, I'm going to have to stop yep. your yep. sharing. And Tim, quickly, where can people go if they want to learn more about your fund? Yeah, so uh, just Google Apollo Capital or uh, ApolloCap.io. Uh, there's also a newsletter which we put out every Tuesday uh, and there's also a resources tab at the top of the website. Uh, it's actually broken down into uh, beginner, intermediate and advanced and we've got links to other videos, podcasts, books, uh, blogs, uh, a whole heap of information there um, to, to hopefully you know, give uh, more resources to people looking to learn more. Ah, fantastic. So you have a newsletter that you release weekly? We do, yes. Ah, oh, fantastic. I'm going to go sign up for that straight after this. Um, keep myself up to date with the bit um, crypto world. Um, so again, for anyone who is wanting to learn more about Ladies Finance Club, we have just closed our doors to our Australian one, but we're happy to um, open them if you use this link for anyone who would like to um, give it a test before you invest. So what Ladies Finance Club is all about is trying to get you 
to take control of your finances. So we do this a couple of ways. Um, the main way, let me get this working. Um, the main way is we've got two levels. We've got the pink membership and the diamond membership. So the pink membership is really about, we have monthly masterclasses every, um, once every month, um, where with a leading international or Australian financial experts. This can be um, from anything from ETFs to constructing a portfolio, to um, how to get started investing. Um, we cover a real range. Um, you get an insurance review. Um, we have tribe accountability check-ins where we all meet once a month. You talk about what your goals are and we keep you accountable. And then we have a fierce financial um, foundation course, which is all about um, getting up to speed really fast on the basics. So how do you set up your bank accounts? What should you, um, how do you budget? Um, how do you get out of debt? Um, you know, what insurances are important to know about? What should you be doing with your super? How do you find your super? So we cover it all there. And then we also give you access to all the past webinars. So this webinar will be on there with a bunch of other webinars as well. Um, and then we also um, will have bonus um, webinars as well every now and then. So we've got one coming up on money mindset. Um, at the end of the month, we're doing a um, investing trends uh, 2021 with Magellan tomorrow night. Um, and then for those people who want to kind of fast track and do our diamond membership, um, that is all about helping you start up a side hustle. So how to get started um, running a side, um, a side business while you are working full time. So we have amazing experts talking about how to test an idea. What should you have on a website? How do you create an online course? Um, and it's really important for women, um, especially if they're thinking about children to have another source of income so they are not super reliant um, and they have more control over their future and whether and when they go back to work and all about that. So if you want to join our tribe, as mentioned, we did close yesterday, but there's a link there. Um, and if you sign up to that, you will get access um, to try for seven free days so you can test before you invest. But thank you everyone so much for joining us this evening. A massive thank you um, for Tim for doing such a great job of breaking down Crypto 101. Um, within an hour, I think that's definitely deserves snaps and a bowl of something. So we'll definitely send you out something. And um, the winner of the Instagram competition, um, it looked like it was uh, Grace Carey. So I will send you a message now, Grace, congratulations. And you won our online call. Us. Well, I will let everyone have their Tuesday night back, but thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you so much, Tim, for joining LFC um, on a Tuesday evening. <laughs> no, thanks for having me, Will. It's been great. Awesome.